Okay. Today, um, I'm going to talk about mapping emotional arousal in nature. I'm Dr. Andre Mitash. I'm a senior lecturer at Beda University of Applied Sciences. And it's an absolute delight for me to present at uh, Slovak Technical University, where both of my parents got, I would say, the majority of their various degrees. Uh, so I've been walking by these buildings my entire childhood, my entire life when visiting Bratislava, and now I finally step inside and get to present in the in the rooms where they learn stuff. So that's that's super fun for me. Um, in Breda, uh, I work in two different labs that have something to do with GIS. Uh, in the experience lab, we measure emotions from the body and the brain and geolocate them to create emotion maps like I will show you today. And in the places and flows lab, we study how people move through space and how that over time creates meaning. Uh, the main point of my presentation today is to ask you for your feedback and your opinions about the right software and the right software pipeline to take our emotion mapping projects uh, further to the next step. I'm going to do this in, in four small parts. First, I'm going to explain what we mean by experiences and why emotions are important. Then I'm going to talk about experiences in nature in particular and why we had some questions about those we wanted to research. Then I'm going to show you some emotion maps created in QGIS and in R. And finally, I'll show you emotion effectiveness maps, which we think is kind of our next direction with emotion mapping research and uh, ask you to think about, you know, the best software pipeline for these. So our university is a small professional school in the Netherlands focused on experiences. And we connect with experience management industries like leisure, tourism, events, entertainment. And the slogan of our university is creating meaningful experiences. Now, to relate to our industry partners, it's important to define and have kind of a shared understanding of what an experience actually is. They all want to provide good experiences for people, good experiences for visitors. So we went to the psychology and neuroscience literatures and put together a theoretical model that explains what do we mean by this word experience? Now, normally when psychologists talk about experiences, they refer to the stream of consciousness, the fact that when you wake up in the morning, you are aware of something happening and you stay aware of things happening basically during the entire day, unless I get a little boring, and uh, uh, all the way until you go to sleep and your, your consciousness for the day sort of ends. But underneath this, there is a whole process. And what we mean by experience is that whole process by which consciousness is created. It starts with two different sets of inputs external inputs and internal ones. The internal ones are like the sensation of your own body heat that you're getting, you know, kind of the longer the windows stay closed in this room, uh, and also your thoughts that are running through your head. Uh, the external stimuli you take in through your five senses, right? So you can hear my thundering voice, you can see my slides up here, and that's all information that your brain is taking in. However, those stimuli by themselves have no meaning. Your brain has to pass them through a set of mental models. So you have a mental model for conference presentation, for presenter, for a screen. Um, you have mental models for different words and what they mean. And by passing the kind of stimuli you're experiencing through those mental models, you become conscious of a conference presentation. However, our brains are also kind of judgment machines. We either like or dislike basically everything, right? So you, whether you know it or not, and whether you like it or not, you are judging me, you are judging my slides, you either want more of this or less of that. And together, these mental models that are being activated for, for example, boxes and arrows and how they connect, and the fact that you either agree or disagree or like or dislike them, together, 
that makes your continuous sense of experiencing something. And this is a tremendously rich stream of information. It's very intense. So our brain needs help to kind of put it into pieces and decide what we react to. Because if we reacted to everything, we would be crazy, or we would be my eight-year-old son. Um, so our brain also has mental models for time, like, for example, tram ride, walk to the building, coffee break, presentation. These are mental models for time, right? And when one thing ends, your brain's thinking, okay, that episode is over, now a new episode is beginning. And this helps us kind of manage that stream of consciousness. But every day is going to have hundreds, if not thousands of episodes, and we can't possibly remember or react to them all. Uh, so here, emotions play a tremendously important role, because while we have a positive or negative reaction to almost everything, sometimes that reaction is a very, very strong, right? Something is either really great, really exciting, or it's terrible, it's scary, it makes us very angry. And that's our mind's way of telling us that this is important, now you have to react, now you have to remember things. So emotions are actually the key to experiences, because experiences come and go with basically very little effect on you unless they're emotional enough. So what we try to bring to the industry is to tell them, hey, you want to know about experiences, what you need to do is you need to measure people's emotions. And we also brought that to their questions about natural areas, such as parks, national parks, nature conservatories, and uh, these, these areas are facing a lot of challenges these days because people realize that it's healthy to be out in nature and more and more want to visit these beautiful places. However, the places have been designed to accommodate visitors, but a small number of visitors that can sort of walk or bike or boat through these areas and not really have a big impact on the plants or the animals living there. However, uh, now some of these, at peak moments, some of these areas are starting to become crowded. So for the past 10 years or so, people who manage these areas have tried a new idea to manage the flow of visitors, which is like here, putting a very beautiful, very expensive architectural features to uh, try to concentrate visitors in one place, away from vulnerable areas, and to also teach them something about how to behave and get them to behave in a more environmentalist way, and especially try to manage their impacts as they later move through the park, right? And there's, there's many examples of this that include lookout towers, bridges, benches, museums. This is a bird hide, a bird observatory. Um, and you see these popping up in, in all sorts of natural areas as an attempt to manage visitors. However, the way that people um, experience these is not well known and has never been measured. And even the step before that, understanding how people's emotions ebb and flow over the course of their visit to a natural area is also not really well known. So we decided to study this at a fort in the Netherlands. And you wouldn't think of a fort as a natural area, but the Netherlands is a very developed, uh, built-up country um, uh, with, with very dense uh, population. So forts are actually some of the more green and natural areas where people visit to get in touch with nature. We studied Fort de Rovere. It's in the southwest of the Netherlands. As you can maybe faintly see here, it's like a four-pointed star fort, and it's surrounded by quite dense forest on, uh, on three sides. And it has a couple of special architectural features. Specifically, this lookout tower. This here is one of the four points, the four bastions. The other one comes down here. And then it has this bridge, which is sort of down in the water. So when you walk across this bridge, you're at about chest level with the water, and you can really see in a closer way than, than usual the aquatic plants and life. Um, we 
intercepted uh, 57 visitors on busy weekends as they entered the fort, asked them to participate in research. Um, we gave them pre- and post-visit questionnaires to measure uh, variables like their well-being and their sense of connection with nature. We used a smartphone to record their location during their visit using GPS. And we used a wearable wristband to record their emotional arousal continuously over their visit using their skin conductance. This is what it looked like, right? So it has two electrodes on the fingers, passes an electrical current in between, and if you process the data correctly to take out the effects of heat and movement, then you have a pretty accurate index of how emotional someone is on really a, a sort of second-to-second -second, uh, uh, basis. So then uh, it's possible to combine these processed skin conductance data together with the GPS data and make an emotion map of where at the fort people became more or less emotional. And here's a small kind of crop of an emotion map made with QGIS. And um, in this lighting, it's pretty hard to see, but basically these are the four points of the fort. Here is the lookout tower, so you can see that's a pretty emotional spot. And here is the bridge, which is quite a bit less emotional. This is all a really thick forest, so less emotional still. Uh, let's see, I think I have, yeah, that's the call out for the, for the lookout tower and for the bridge. Um, maybe a, a bit of a shortcoming of this map, which of course could be could be adjusted in QGIS, is I think these hex bins are huge. There's something like 10 or 20 meters. They're they're way too big. Also, this thick black line between them doesn't doesn't really look good. Um, here's the same thing that I made in R. Again, it's not the whole map, but I'm kind of zooming in on the on the fort here and again you see okay this this tower is quite emotionally arousing but then you know so is the area near the parking lot um the bridge less so as you go more into the forest basically people get more and more calm okay that's just to orient you with the locations a bit so that's that's basically uh uh, the emotion map done using hex binning. Um, uh, a colleague has also uh, created it uh, with spline interpolation in grass. That's something uh, uh, I am not able to do yet. However, the development that we wanted to focus on is not just where people became more or less emotional and modeling that statistically, but adding a third variable in there to create what we call an emotion effectiveness map. So let me explain how that works. Um, the emotion effectiveness map is something that also uh, Helen Amitashova first developed in grass in this paper, which we published about four or five years ago, called More is Not Better. Uh, that's based on a cultural heritage experience about the painter Vincent van Gogh and the village where he learned how to paint. Um, and then I wanted to apply the idea of the emotion effectiveness map also to the fort. So the idea behind this is. You have this hex grid, right, over your entire site. Imagine one hex bin. You have different visitors from who you're recording emotions and location, and some of them might pass through this hex bin. And some of them might take a long path through the hex bin, so they might leave, let's say, a lot of data points. Some of them leave fewer data points. But each one of these data points has an associated skin conductance measurement with it, right? So for each participant within each hex bin, we can calculate an average skin conductance, right? So Mr. Green was aroused at 0 0.001 on average within this hex bin. Maybe he went to the next one and then he got more excited or whatever. And we can also calculate that for the blue person and the orange person. So within each hex bin, we can calculate an average skin conductance for each person. However, when those people exited the site, we also gave them a questionnaire where we asked a bunch of stuff, including uh, how connected during your visit did you feel with nature? 
on a five point scale, right? So for example, one person might have felt very connected with nature, they gave a five, this person reported in the middle of the scale, a three, this person a five. And so we have data within each hex bin from each person. And based on that, we can calculate a correlation. And the emotion effectiveness map is a map of these correlations, right? So it's a hex bin map of between individual correlations of average skin conductance within each hex bin and a response on their questionnaire item afterwards. So here is the emotion effectiveness map of Fort de Rovere uh, on the correlation between skin conductance and connecting with nature. Uh, here you see there's, there's a negative effectiveness of the bridge, meaning people who were more connected with nature afterwards were the people who had a more calm experience on the bridge. And it's positive here at the tower. So people who felt more connected with nature became more emotional on the tower, right? So you would say intense emotions on the tower are effective in connecting people with nature and calm emotions also here in the forest and on the bridge are effective in connecting people with nature. And so the question is, I, so I made this purely in R with a focus on handling the data and calculating the correlations, which is the kind of thing that R is really good at. At this point, as far as I've gotten in R is to put this OSM background map behind the data, right? Not very far. I would like to use the layer handling and the flexibility and the plugins of QGIS to take these emotion effectiveness maps and make them a little bit more like fancy and, and beautiful and more explanatory. So with that, I, I conclude with my question for you, which is, how would you suggest going about this in terms of, you know, my, my platform and my processing pipeline? Is the best thing to do the calculations in R and the mapping in QGIS? Or should I write some Python for QGIS to do the calculations and the data handling for a motion effectiveness map? I'm just curious if anyone has experiences with, with these kinds of, of issues and, and can give me some advice. And with that, I'll wrap up. Um, please check out my YouTube channel, The Science of Traveling Well, where I talk about great tourism experiences and the science behind what makes them so enjoyable. And this is the address of the Breda Tourism Panel. That's a recurring data collection I do once every six months where I ask about your quality of life and your vacation experiences. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. That was a really interesting presentation, and uh, I think very different from other presentations that we see here. I've noticed really <laughs> the emotions. I learned a lot. Um, are there any questions, or if people want to answer the question of Andre, let's start over there. Christian Brandstetter, uh, Austrian Environmental Agency. Thank you very much. Uh, the, I must say the title did not uh, lead to, to this uh, presentation very well, I must say. I was expecting less, honestly. But I have like two questions that would come like in your tower, you experienced this, this high <laughs> arousal. Do the people walk steps? Are they physically exha uh, exhausted there? This is the first question. And the second, Issue I had, like you, you completely neglected time, no? Like some people stay longer, some people stay less long. That would also mean that I don't know. Maybe some people. How how did you deal with time? Yeah? Did you? It's hard to interpret, of course. I mean, if you have a child, maybe you go slower. But if you like uh, focus more and and are more close to nature, then you maybe stay longer uh, as well. Huh? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, the, the short version is that physical activity is taken into account, time is not. 
Um, the way that physical activity is taken into account is that physical activity changes skin conductance fairly slowly. So you would say over maybe 10 to 20 seconds or even minutes, you know, as you become more and more physically active, you get more and more sweaty. However, emotional responses uh, in skin conductance develop over one to four seconds. And one of, one of the steps that we go through in sort of filtering skin conductance data is we filter out the slow from the fast changes, right? So there we get mostly the emotional data. Physical activity can also like move the electrodes themselves on the hand. And then that results in much faster changes, like less than one second. And those we filter out by hand. We call those motion artifacts. We have an algorithm to detect possible candidates in just a very basic way using standard deviation. Um, and then we filter those out by hand because they're pretty obvious, either notches or spikes uh, over like usually about half a second. And we know like we have to erase those because it's not physiologically possible. But also if you have kind of a raw skin conductance trace, you see this kind of very spiky line that's gradually going up as the person gets more and more sweaty. And then a procedure called deconvolution, that happens sort of automatically, um, filters out that gradual increase from the spikiness, which is what's reflecting the emotion. Uh, now, in terms of time, it's true that uh, let's say an, an average skin conductance will probably be lower in a hex bin where people spend a lot of time because of that spiky nature of the skin conductance signal. Uh, but that's something that we haven't carried over in into our analyses. And yeah, that would be really interesting to look at. More questions or answers to his questions. Thanks for a really interesting presentation. I have a question. So when you conduct some kind of research like that, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to create um, like a report or some recommendations for the place where you did this research? For example, have a look, please. There is a place where people are exhausted completely. Please do something with it, something like that. Yeah, in, indeed. That's that's a really great question because that's that's the question that basically drives all of our funding. <laughs> so if we if we can't make uh, recommendations, then we can't do the research because we have no funding for it. Um, here, the question was whether these architectural features are effective, and the project was done together with a national park in another location that has a big crowding problem that's considering whether or not it's worth investing in these architectural features as a way of spreading tourists away from crowded places. And our advice was to them, yes, it is a good idea to create these kinds of architectural features because the other thing they were considering is trying to attract more people to more of these trails that were deep in the forest. And here, lower arousal on those trails was associated with better outcomes. And the same effect, but even more dramatically, was measured at the other site. So we told them, please do not make those trails more crowded. You want those trails to have a minimum of visitors like they do now. Instead, those visitors that concentrate too much in the parking lot, in the visitor center, in the more popular trails, maybe pull some of them away to a lookout tower. Uh, like they do here at Fort de Rovre, then you can create a great experience over there and keep the quiet trails quiet. Quick question. If not, oh, then uh, applause. And Thanks. I appreciate it. Yep. A little present from the organizers. All right. Thank you so much.